So you've decided to podcast conversations with B2B marketers about what truly matters to building scalable, sustainable, and substantial marketing growth. In today's episode, what are the need to knows for podcasting? And what are the mistakes that B2B marketers make with podcasting? And our top three tips to making an impact with a podcast. Today, I'm joined by Paul Barlow a journalist by trade, content strategist, and podcaster. Welcome back, Paul. What's been happening in your world? Thanks for having me again, Sam. Oh, it, it's been a strange one, actually. It's relatively quiet at the moment and not too many death threats, so I must be doing something okay. Oh, your, your electioneering is over. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's all quiet and down now, which is really good in terms of, of keeping people quiet and, and keeping them in place. Um, a few shifts in... in dynamics now because the government sort of opened up considerations around law changes around local government. So it sort of shift the focus a little bit towards that. Lots more boring paperwork to read more than anything. Maybe for those that uh, don't know, uh, talk a little bit about what you've been doing around local body sure. uh, elections. Yeah. Um, so tune into the episode that we've done on I remember what the episode was. We've done another episode where we've talked about this. People should be listening to all the episodes anyway. Um, but over the local body election period here in New Zealand, it was a case of sitting down and creating TikToks around individual candidates, particularly the ones who weren't the best out there. They were the ones who were spreading misinformation or disinformation, who weren't being genuine about the reasons that they were running um, and, and sort of focusing on the reasons why people shouldn't be voting for them and should be looking into more qualified candidates, which did pretty well. It got, got itself a decent audience. Um, I, th I think the most viewed video we had was 140,000 views when we outed a Nazi in Wellington. So it, it's certainly been an interesting ride. Right. Oh, well, coming back to Earth and, and talking about B2B marketing then for a moment. Yes, um, something much so, safer. Yes. Um, let's talk about some of the, the typical mistakes we see B2B marketers making around podcasting. Um, I guess, what would you say is uh, different about podcasting compared to, say, live streaming? So I think podcasting, you have to remember your audience is going to be coming back. A live stream, its initial audience is going to be the biggest audience that it gets. Usually, if you've marketed it well and you, you know who you're talking to. Um, but a podcast is something that has to retain the same quality and value ongoing for the audience to keep coming back to. So somebody could listen to it in a week or in a month and they're still getting the same value out of it as when they first started. And for B2B in particular, that means knowing who your audience is, knowing who it is that you're talking to and what your core messaging is. If you don't get that balance right, you can really miss out on, on who it is that you're trying to talk to. Yeah, I guess one of the things about uh, live streams is that they are an event, and so you have to be prepared in the moment. Uh, one of the differences, though, with, with podcasting is that... Obviously, they're pre-recorded, so you can edit uh, the content. Um, but I guess one of the things I've noticed is people not really being properly prepared. Um, so, you know, things like uh, having a decent microphone, understanding the sound environment that they're in and making sure that you, you know, microphones are super sensitive um, these days. And, you know, we're actually competing or podcast competes with radio. And so you have an audience out there that's conditioned to sound engineering that's of the same uh, or of a high standard, so to speak. What are some of the other um, yeah, considerations? I think for me, the big one is it really does come down to planning and how, how you're planning on, on getting the word out for a start, but also on maintaining that audience. For me, the way that the distribution model is almost like the opposite of a live event or, or a live stream in that you know for a live stream you want to promote the date, the time, you get people watching and your viewer numbers are going to decline. With a podcast in theory, you should still be putting it out regularly, and if you grow yourself a decent audience, they'll pop in on the day that it comes out, 
but you want to see an increase in viewers as it goes along. It, it's learning those differences, I think, are the, the most important thing when it comes to planning your podcast, knowing the content that's in there. But in terms of quality control, making sure you've got a space that it works on is, is a really good one, a, a space that you can work in yourself. Um, I, I remember when I first actually started in radio, one of the first things I was told by the sound engineers I was working with, if you've got a room that's a funny shape, make that your studio because sound travels differently in it and do what you can to muffle sound within there, which is something a lot of people forget or yeah. don't think about because you don't see it. Um, mm -hmm. But there are little tricks that you can use. Um, egg cartons was my favorite one that I got told about when we were, when I was studying film. Egg cartons are a great shape for breaking up sound. So yeah, learning that the area that you're recording in is a really big part. Um, and if you do it well, nobody at the end knows that you've done it well. Yeah, I, I recall stories of um, uh, during the pandemic of um, BBC uh, radio announcers having to huddle under a duvet to um, yep. record in in, <laughs> in the hot water cupboard or, or something <laughs> like along those yeah. lines. Yeah, yeah so, I, I think it's brilliant how clever people can be with that. <laughs> yeah, so understand the environment. Um, I guess uh, another one is uh, editing, you know, often underestimated. It, it, yeah, editing is a really tricky one. With, with podcasts, obviously, everything that you intake is is oral. So 100% of what you do and how it sounds is how people are going to interpret it. But we're really good at picking up cuts in dialogue and cuts in timelines. So if that's not cut well, it feels jumpy and it feels really out of place and that can draw people out of what it is that you're wanting them to listen to. But if you're doing something that's B2B where you want a professional quality level, that really drops the quality perspective from the person that's listening to it. So editing is a really key factor to making sure that you're selling the product well, but that you're also giving yourself some credibility behind what you're doing. Hmm. And certainly one that I didn't realize um, going into podcasting is the importance of hosting and distribution. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a really big one. It's, it feels like it should be easy to just go, right, I want this out on whatever the platforms are that are out there that you want to use. And, and the majority of people are going to catch it on a platform like Apple Podcasts or Spotify, because those are our, our sort of big distribution hubs. But there are platforms out there like Stitcher, for example, which is much more specific in the content that it has and much more specific in the audience that it's got and much more easily navigatable for people who know what they're after. So it's, it's really important, I think, to look at all of your distribution channels. To actually get them out there is actually pretty easy. Like Most hosting sites allow you to pick and choose. You just enter a couple of bits of code from one to the other and it distributes it automatically. It's just knowing which of those channels is going to be the best one for you. And there's no reason why you can't have a scattergun approach, but you should know that doing a scattergun approach means that somebody might be listening to you on Apple because they can or because they've got half an hour to kill, whereas somebody might be listening to you on Stitcher because they specifically want to hear the sort of content that you're creating and knowing how well your data that you're collecting from both of those points is going to feed your decisions going forward. Yeah, I, I would say from my own uh, listening perspective, I came across Stitcher probably eight years ago uh, and it was driven by a very niche uh, concept, which is being able to listen to a whole variety of different shows from right around the world. Having lived in the UK, uh, having lived in the States, you know, This American Life was something that I really enjoyed on NPR in, in the States. Um, and Friday Night Comedy in uh, the UK on, on Radio 4 was something that I wanted to be able to get access to, to listen to in the car or while I was walking the dog. Um, and Stitcher was just like a super good choice um, to be able to pick it up from wherever, automatically get that um, feed. Oops. Uh, and, you know, mistake number number one, don't bash the table <laughs> while you're talking. Um, uh, so, yeah, it, it was a, a niche thing, but 
essentially, I've you, I hear about podcasts from other sources, and then look for them on Stitcher to to just get them each week, and and you know I'll pick and choose um, from that selection of things. Yeah. Podcast growth through word of mouth is essential. Uh, you've got to have something that your audience connects to that they want to talk about. And I think it's one of the few forms of marketing these days or forms of content that you create that has that as a bonus to it. Like word of mouth is still an essential part of how we, we interact with everybody. Even if it's digitally these days because of the pandemic or whatever, you're still telling people something that they should go out and watch. It could be a, a review on Facebook and somebody going, check this out, have a listen to it. Um, I, I was actually looking for one specifically the other day about filmmaking in, in this country, like New Zealand filmmakers, nothing, nobody could recommend yeah. anything to me. And, and so what's the point of searching if the people who I know who are in those circles don't know anything about it, don't have content, makes it really hard to find content that you agree with. Word of mouth is definitely a key factor to making this work. So I, I suppose to, um, summarize then, uh, kind of common mistake number one is essentially not having somebody that uh, is a producer effectively. You know, I think those that grew up in radio, your producer was the linchpin to, to making it all work. Um, I, I think for most media creation, a producer is really essential if you want to make sure you've got an outside perspective that can keep you moving in the right direction. That, that's the key for, for what a good producer does. Well, at the same time, ensuring that you can do what you need to do from a technical perspective. Okay. And uh, I guess the other side to that producer is also somebody that knows about the promotion side of things. How do you build that word of mouth and make those connections? Yeah, and for B2B, it's a little bit different if you're doing something personal or if you're promoting your own project. Um, for B2B, it's using those connections that you've got and finding those networks that are in place that are going to hit the right market. Because everything you create is to a certain niche, but if you look at something like LinkedIn as an example, everybody has huge amounts of connections on LinkedIn that they don't work with specifically. And then you've got second and third connections as well. That's a great tool for getting the word out there and then using the right sort of hashtags, the right sort of promotional phrasing for it to be picked up by algorithms to be found. There are tools there that, that pretty much everyone can use. If your producer can do that, I think that's really good because they can pull that into what they're producing in the content and how they drive you as a content creator. But if you can get somebody else who also knows what they're doing, who can work well with your producer and well with your talent, that's also a really good move. Yeah. Okay, um, uh, I guess I've also noticed um, that as part of the, the pandemic, everyone either decided to start a podcast or uh, started to uh, a YouTube channel of some sort. Um, and one of the differences, perhaps between our different perspectives, um, you being a journalist and, and myself being a, a B2B marketer, uh, is the degree of uh, preparation versus spontaneity in terms of you know conversation you you want your content to be engaging and interesting because typically b2b content isn't that interesting um and certainly some of the funding models that there are around um demand <laughs> generation and campaigns yep. you know require you to be plugging the product how do you strike that right balance between preparation and spontaneity and, and content strategy effectively? For, for me, spontaneity works better in radio than it does in podcasts, only because radio is live and it's going out at the same time. So spontaneity helps keep things moving. With podcasts, you want, an, for me, again, you want an element of spontaneity, but you want it to feel relaxed but that means that you've got to have the information beforehand to be able to make that relaxed feeling feel organic. Otherwise, you have somebody coming in and you're sitting there talking about topics you might have no idea about, or they might be dealing specifically with a product that they want to push or promote that just you, you're not engaging with it yourself, so your audience isn't engaging with it. And I think some prep is really good, but you're right, when it comes to the journalistic background, you want to keep people talking so you can get answers out of them. And for me, that's how I build my personal podcasts. It's about having a chat, 
getting what I can out of them, talking to them about specific things that they want to get out as well. So, you know, if they've got that passion, you can pull that passion through. When it comes to B2B, it, it does feel to me a little bit drier, but it, it also has to feel drier. Otherwise, it's not quite going to have the same push to it or the, the same outcome that you need it to have. Yeah, I guess coming back to that uh, idea around content strategy and the fact that you know, podcast is a slow burn. It's it's not something that's going to have an impact in ninety days. It's it's uh, producing regular, meaningful, resonant content uh, with that niche audience that you're promoting into those niches. But actually, having good content strategy is probably key. Yeah, it is. And I think if you build up a podcast really well, it gives you more than just a podcast in terms of content that you can put out there. You know, there's snippets that you can take that you can use to promote it. There's learnings that you can get. You can do um, like, like physical writings out of it. Like you can get a whole bunch of different physical elements that you then use to promote either the material that you're creating, the product that you're putting out there, the business that you're trying to promote. Um, it, but it all has to be a long-term thing as well. You can't just assume, right, I've got a podcast, I've got this episode, it's absolutely amazing, and I've got photos and a snippet and a write-up on it. Um, boom, that's 90-day return. It, it has to be a slow burn because that's just how people find and disseminate the information anyway. And rushing it means that you're going to get terrible results at the end when that, that interest drops off. People will look at it now, they won't come back to it later. Right. And... I guess on the flip side, in terms of getting guests onto your podcast, um, mm -hmm. I, I've certainly found that there is a greater degree of comfort for people that are perhaps not as comfortable being on camera to be involved in a, in a podcast. What have you found in yeah. terms of ease of getting uh, guests and having that, that Some... conversation? So some people don't like it. Like they're just like not comfortable in front of the camera. The most common excuse I get is I don't like the sound of my voice, which is a really common thing. Nobody likes the sound of their voice initially. You kind of have to train yourself out of it. But a lot of people, because I, I do my podcast with video recording as well, so they see themselves there watching themselves and, and how they respond. Um, the, the, they also come across a little bit nervous if they're not used to working around a microphone when you initially start. So I, I have this thing where you know, I will do a fuck up in the first couple of minutes of recording with somebody who hasn't done it before, just so I can put them at ease and it, it makes them feel like, oh, well, I can fuck up as well, which is exactly what I want. Um, I actually did that with a client not that long ago, and it was very deliberate. I sat down with the producer and I right, this is the screw up I'm going to do at the beginning because these guys are really robotic when we talk. Mm -hmm. um, I find if you can keep people at ease, they soon forget about the fact that there's a camera and a microphone there, and it, that's where the conversation side of things comes in. When it's B2B, it is a little bit harder because you feel like you're there, you're there selling, or you feel like you're there making a business connection. And so it does feel more formal, mm. but practice is really what it's going to come down to. Make them comfortable in, in this environment that they're in. So uh, I guess if there's a kind of common mistake that that we've seen which is number two it's uh, treating a podcast as too much of a conversation and not enough of a uh, yeah yeah I, I think it's taking it too easy if you just assume i have a microphone and a camera i can record this it'll be fine it, it, there has to be some level of preparation otherwise you're going to not have an engaging piece of content at the end of it yeah and then Lastly, I, th I think, you know, kind of summarizing or, or, or touching on uh, what we've already talked about in terms of content strategy, you know, it, it really is a slow burn, uh, what you're trying to do with a podcast. It's, it's not something that you set out to uh, produce, you know, half a dozen episodes of. It's actually more of a commitment than people perhaps realize if you're going to yield benefit from it. Have you seen you oh, know, yes. examples of people uh, or organizations you know, not really thinking it through? Yeah, oh, very much so. Um, 
one of the people I actually went to university with, he got really into podcasts when it first came out, and he's spent the last 20 years building up a podcast industry around him. And so he initially started off with quirky stuff, like trying to break world records. That was initially what he wanted to build his podcast around. Um, he's got to the point now where in the last 12 months, he's actually built a mobile studio that he's using in community groups to help them build their own podcasts, which is really cool to see. It's just a converted um, caravan that he's got that he's kitted everything out with. But seeing him go from those initial you know, let's have a bit of fun, this, it, it'll be great. All the way through that, over 20 years, he's built himself a really core audience who knows his style and knows what he does and knows it can change, but also know that at the very center of it is always going to be him telling his stories in his way. And he's, for the last 10 years or so, his, his mission has been to find people who blow his mind. I think wow. that was a really cool sort of niche to create for himself because it gives him a lot of scope and that's also allowed him to then go into you know, schools and workplaces community groups with this this sort of mobile podcast studio that he's got and said and look do what you can to blow your own mind i'm here just to press the buttons and make sure you've got the tools for it so i, I think that kind of thing is very cool to see because he's built himself a brand out of it and he's having fun with it yeah, that puts me in mind of a situation I was in about two weeks ago when uh, I was staying in an Airbnb and the internet connection was horrible and the mobile connection was horrible because I was in the shadow of a cell tower and I ended up getting a small electric car and, and creating a radio car <laughs> with, with the road yeah. microphone suspended from the, the <laughs> handle that... Um, uh, yeah, so I, I guess... Kiwi that, ingenuity. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> precisely. <laughs> so not having a content strategy is, is probably mistake number three, if if we were to yeah. sum it up. Okay, so yeah, I, let's, I say so. let's talk uh, a little bit about some of our suggestions and, and recommendations about how to get it right. Um, what are our top tips? Um I th I think number one is a microphone, but uh, yep. knowing how they work, um, you can buy a microphone over the counter relatively cheaply, but if you don't know how a microphone works, what the pickup area is, that kind of thing, you're doing yourself a disservice. Yeah, and, and I guess it's, it's more than just the microphone, it's the environment that you have, the acoustic environment, and getting that right. Uh, one thing I've noticed, for instance, is that uh, AirPods are actually no good for po podcasting. <laughs> no, uh, they're not. They're fine uh, for live and, and, streaming. Uh, I but get, they're comfy. Yeah. And and yeah, despite what it, it... Sorry. Oh, I was going to say that the quality from the microphone is terrible on them. They're too far away from your mouth to be able to pick much up. Yeah. Um, despite what it may look like, I'm actually using these AirPods to hear what Paul is saying, uh, rather than uh, <laughs> them as a microphone. You know, here is the microphone. Capture that, Riverside. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> so first of all is you know equipment, sound, and your and your peripherals, your environment. Uh, and I, I suppose that also includes the recording software. And you've had some experience with different recording software? Yeah, I mean, for me personally, I prefer to still use Riverside. It, it's for, for podcast creation and audio recording, it allows me to have an audio and a video file separately. I'm old school in that I was trained on video and I still prefer to edit video before creating an audio version of it. So that, that helps a lot. Um, but in terms of audio software, I've played around with a few of them over the years. And to be honest, I kind of keep going back to GarageBand. It's just, it's relatively simple to use. It's a really easy interface and it comes on my phone and my computer. So it's there when I need it. So yeah, it's simple doesn't necessarily mean bad. Yeah, and we'll put some links down below to um, uh, actually YouTube channels. So Think Media is a channel that I subscribe to that have uh, great suggestions on you know getting you set up right, 
in some of these uh, tricks and traps uh, for beginners. Um, <clears throat> I guess the next thing is, uh, you know, how you set all of this up and, and actually manage the production. So it kind of comes back to that first idea, get yourself a, a pro producer. Yep. Yeah, I, th I think so. Have an idea is, is definitely the first place to start because once you've got that, you might find somebody who's a good producer for that idea that wouldn't necessarily work well on another one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but at the same time, it, it all really comes down to how your content strategy is as well as how you've got that laid out. What's your timeline for your lead-in to start recording? How much extra episodes do you have in the can? You know, what, what's your sort of release schedule Finding the right producer to help you through all that is a really good first step. Yeah. Um, any recommendations? Um, feel free to give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, possibly you don't want to advertise your number, uh, given your the number of stalkers out there. I, but <laughs> I, I will make sure that there is a connection to my LinkedIn in the description in the bio. <laughs> Excellent. All right. And then uh, lastly... Um, I guess it is about distribution and promotion. Um, uh, I guess, uh, Paul, you've had your own experience around distribution. Uh, personally, I, I'm an advocate for Buzzsprout. Um, uh, and, I, and I guess one of the things about the distribution and hosting software is that there are different ones and not one single one would be right for for necessarily yeah. all types of, of podcasts. So what's been your experience yeah. around I, distribution? I, I actually looked into it really carefully before I started my lockdown um, show, my, my lockdown podcast. Um, and for me, I found Anchor FM was the best one for me personally for hosting and that it was super simple to be able to navigate. It gave you a really basic rundown in terms of, of data that was coming through to be able to analyze, uh, gives you a fair bit of feedback in terms of, of who's watching, when they're watching and sort of the longevity of the content. So you can track that. Um, so for, for me, anchor was just super easy. So I didn't want to overcomplicate things. So I, I, I guess, to be helpful to our listeners, we'll put a link to another um, vlog or YouTube channel uh, that does comparisons on on the different ins and outs of distribution and hosting. And and I guess the very last thing is is around the promotion side of things and the importance of generating that word of mouth and and getting people to subscribe to your podcast. Yeah, if you're going for B2B, LinkedIn, I think, is still your best place to go, unless you've built up a brand awareness on another platform and, and then use that. So if you've got a strong brand presence on something like Instagram, definitely use that. Tap into it because you've got people who are aware of what you're doing. You could look at creating a new sort of brand awareness element in one of those platforms if you haven't. But you also have to be aware, again, it's not going to be a quick fix. You're not going to have a million people sign up to a brand new Instagram on the first day because you're, you're doing a podcast on B2B. But over six months or 12 months, you can slowly build that audience up to a point that you're quite comfortable with it. But definitely use the connections you've got first and foremost. Again, it's just old-fashioned word of mouth in a digital era. Yeah, and, and I guess uh, as a secret source uh, idea... Uh, from a B2B strategy standpoint, the one thing that I notice a lot of B2B marketers overlook is the use of remarketing or retargeting as a way of uh, connecting with your audience. Um, in fact, you know, what we'll do is it, uh, an episode on the power of retargeting and remarketing as, as a as a tool for B2B marketers, because it is the single most cost-effective way in which you can build and engage with an audience. And I've often described it as being like your radio station, it just so happens to be yeah. pushing messages in front of people as they navigate um, social channels and, and uh, search channels. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it is one of those tools that if people don't know about it or don't know the power of it, they really need to start looking into it now. All right. 
So, um, to summarize, uh, you know, get a producer, get the gear, get set up, and most important, get your content strategy in order. Yeah, agree 110%. <laughs> All right. Um, so with that uh, curious mathematical uh, <laughs> interpretation <laughs> of percentages, um, <laughs> we'll, we'll leave it there. This is why I do media. I was never a good mathematician. <laughs> there you go. All right. Thanks very much, Paul, and we'll see everybody in the in the next episode. Mm-hmm.